chapter 9, part 4. I think we're going to have two more parts. So um, we're at Persopolis. Now the palaces, the whole overall idea with these palaces that we're looking at is the, the largeness or the um, grandeur. If you can imagine this building when it was all put together, it was quite large and, and nothing else. If you look out, you know, you can kind of see even today, this photo is maybe 10 or 20 years old. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, there's all kinds of just open space, right? So you have to remember population numbers were much smaller, you know, if we're looking in the BC, you know, 559 to 300 BC. Very small, right? So when you are out somewhere in your remote village and then you come in and you see this massive palace, it's very intimidating and very uh, impressive. Okay, so there'd be a royal audience hall it was 200 feet square by 60 feet high and it would hold 10,000 people. So you could talk to 10,000 people at one time um, or, you know, gather everybody together and, and as for the presence of the king coming out and, um, you know, talking to his subjects. Very impressive. Okay, we're switching into an another continent entirely. <laughs> we are going to be in Mexico here. Um, so the Palenque, the May Mayan uh, uh, palace in Chiapas, Mexico. So many, many different cultures. We have Mayan, we have Aztec, we have Incan in uh, Central and South America have a similar kind of pyramidal um, structures. Now these are made from often with just piles of dirt like the ziggurat and then stone is piled on top. Um, so this has a lot of stone uh, moving up. It's mainly solid. Then we get into a few areas on the top that have windows and open areas that you know can be inhabited and put you know people can walk into. So it had living quarters for the Mayan royalty as a center for religious rites and facilities for astronomical studies and administrative precinct. So we know all these things about it. What's interesting about this, too, is that this was covered, the jungle in this part of Mexico grows very quickly, and this piece was covered until very recently. Uh, and um, it was found, uh, and, and all that was you know, cut back and it was re sort of set up as a tourist destination. Um, there's so many of these structures and now they're finding they have this new technology. They can just fly over and then they can see the geometric shapes um, with kind of like a, a radar type uh, scanning device. I don't know what it's called, but the archaeologists and anthropologists can now do digs much more quickly and efficiently before they'd have to walk in the jungle and just look around. Um, or listen to locals and say, oh, well, I think there's a stone palace here or something like that. But now they scan. They go through the jungle and they scan and they see these geometric shapes and they go back in and uh, dig them out. Okay, so we have our 70-foot tower here. So this, this, in, this added verticality, which, of course, is, you know, closer to the heavens. It's important. Large facing, uh, large windows. These are facing the four cardinal points. And you see this in almost every culture north, south, uh, east, and west, that's important. Um, and that probably the astronomer uh, would have been an important person um, in terms of divination, meaning uh, astronomy, or you know, as we would call it, astrology. At one point in time, those two were connected and it was very important to certain cultures, okay? But also defensive uses, if you think about like having people run up these steps, it's gonna take some energy. And it, this would be surrounded on this top layer with military personnel, and they'd be able to see them coming. So probably a guard would be up in this tower and looking around uh, to see if there were any troops coming to attack. So Chinese royal architecture uh, is connecting um, the emperor to, to being the son, a son of heaven father of the people, and the one who maintained heaven on earth. So we have kind of a high ceiling imitating a heavenly uh, sort of a, a space that we have. Now you see domes a lot in some architecture. Uh, Asian cultures didn't really have the dome so much. 
Um, but the idea that it's an elevated ceiling and look at the throne, everything is very uh, grand on a large scale, high ceilings. Okay. Um, again, going back to the idea that in most cultures, for most of history, the ruler was connected to God or a um, descendant of God. We're switching over to Versailles. This is French, and we are in 1680. So remember how centuries work. This is the 17th century, okay? So if it's 1680, that means it's in the 17th century. It's going to finish, and as soon as it turns to 1700, that is the 18th century. So it's a little confusing if you haven't been familiar with that kind of thing, but just keep in mind we are in the 17th century. Okay, so this is the Baroque era, which we um, now kind of ridicule, or how do you want to say, we use that term Baroque to really describe something that is overly ornate, over the top, um, highly decorated, needlessly decorated in some, some people's minds. So lavish ornamentation, grand size, and then of course we have this high ceiling uh, depicting heaven up here. So connecting him to uh, heavenly um, attributes. And he was thinking that he was connected to the god Apollo, going back to the Greek gods. And in the Renaissance, which was before the Baroque, uh, there is a more of a connection to the ancient Greco-Roman um, concepts of, of divinity and a connection or a blending, you could say, of Christianity and uh, Greco-Roman cultures, okay? That's what the Renaissance is, and some of that gets depicted in the artwork. Um, I am not super familiar with these paintings that we see up here. Uh, it's more to do with this impressiveness of the mirrors on the sides of the walls here and the ornate decoration, the chandeliers, all the gold and that kind of thing, okay? Bronze capitals um, up here, you know, you see a lot of bronze and brass and and sort of gold leaf in different places. So he moved the, the court from Paris to Versailles. If you know about the museum, the Louvre in Paris, that originally was the court of the uh, French king for many, many years, that area, um, and it evolved in different palaces um, over time, but that was the seat of power, and... Um, Louis the 14th, if we look at our uh, Roman numerals, I didn't talk about that much. X is 10, um, the I is 1, and the V is 5. When the I is on this side, it's plus. When it's on this side, it's minus. So 10 and then 1 minus 5 is 4. So uh, it that means the 14th, okay? Louis the 16th, um, well, I don't want to get to skip ahead, but this is Louis the 14th. Does that make sense? So he moved his court um, from Paris to Versailles, which is out of town. It's out, it's out in the woods, sort of. And that was originally his uh, father, I think, or grandfather's hunting cabinet, cabin. And so he transformed it, hired all kinds of people to uh, embellish all and build and, and make the gardens beautiful. The gardens are partly what it's known for, probably almost equally. Okay, So he dominated church, nobility, and peasants. And he controlled art, fashion, and manners. Now, we're building up into um, the time where people get fed up with giving all their money, taxes, into this work. And there's a rebellion a little bit later. But that hasn't happened yet. Okay. This piece here, this is Rococo, this little uh, Fragonard's The Swing. So, um, they occupied their time in games of romance intrigue. So, it's just kind of lots of frolicking and la-di-da and eating cake. <laughs> nothing uh, nothing of any heaviness happening in the court. Um, it, there's play and there's delicious food and there's beautiful fabrics. 